Well, I appreciate that rousing applause. Uh, we're going to talk about the atonement now. The atonement's been a subject of a lot of, uh, a lot of our theology and a lot of our hymnology. I was just looking at a couple of these things that Cook gave us on page 379. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died... My richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt and all my pride. What a great statement of words. I find so much of our modern hymnology so, so weak. Um, I think it's because they're writing for Grammys and money. And uh, they, it's just a desire to get things out. Whereas a lot of the old hymns, these people wrote them out of their hearts, out of their pain, out of their experience that was really traumatic or whatever. And they never... They never thought they'd be famous particularly and didn't plan on making any money much with it, and they didn't. But uh, they had a lot to say. Uh, I love this by Charles Wesley. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? That's poetic. Died he for me who caused his pain. Like Mel Gibson with his uh, hand in the movie. You know, he's the guy that held the nail. For me who him to death pursued. What an interesting statement that I pursued Jesus to death. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Tell me another religion that teaches something that grandiose. Hinduism. <laughs> My teaching is futile. <laughs> Boy, I haven't accomplished much yet. <laughs> Ended. No, nah, nothing, nothing. Nothing approaches the grandeur of the fact that the God of the universe who made the world was nailed to a cross. Hmm. The death of Christ was planned in eternity past, accomplished in history, and will be central in eternity future. Uh... The Passion of the Christ, I think, really was quite a good movie uh, because it focused on something that we sometimes in Protestantism minimize. <clears throat> you know, we're celebrating Easter, but we really don't pay any attention to Good Friday. We just skip right past it. Not everybody, but we do. Do you see the focus on Good Friday in Protestantism? I see it focused on Easter. And I'm not saying Easter is not an important day. I'm, don't, don't get me wrong. But it is at the cross, not in the grave, that the wrath of God was taken. It was on the cross, not in that tomb. that he forgave my sins. It was on the cross. See, no, not on Sunday morning. When he disarmed the principalities and powers. And I could go on, but I, I, the point of it is that the cross is central for Christianity. Now, I understand what Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 15, and I certainly concur with it. That if Christ be not raised, we're yet in our sins. But the reason why is not that the resurrection saved us. The resurrection confirmed the cross. For if he had not come back from the dead, his death on the cross would be no more valuable than any of the men that died on the cross. He would, have been, it would, he would have been proved to be a fake apart from the resurrection. 
the resurrection confirms the truth of the cross. That he could say, I can lay my life down and I can take it up. If he didn't take it up, then he didn't lay it down. You get my point? And so I think we need to recognize it, even though we sometimes almost look at Roman Catholics with their crucifixes and crosses. Oh, you know, I know that. Hey, it's the cross that it all happened. And so let us not minimize the focal point of all history. So, the atonement is central. Take away the cross, and the heart of Christianity is gone, says Thesen. Well, having said that, there have been those in our midst in the past, and even in the present, who look at the cross askance. Think of old Harry Emerson Fosdick who now plays a different tune. (laughs) Who talked about Christianity and fundamentalism being a bloody religion. He said that demeaningly. You know, it is. A bloody death. It was intended to be that way. None of the sacrifices in the temples were stero- you know, in sterile conditions. <laughs> they were all bloody. Because it illustrated something very, very significant. That it takes blood to deal with sin. As far as God's concerned. So, yeah, you want to call Christianity a some kind of bloody religion? Okay. Okay. But I tell you what, it's far and beyond anything else anybody else has come up with. Muhammadism, Islam, has a law giving Muslims and their sons for him. God gave his own son. You know what I mean? He gave his own son for people that didn't deserve it. Try that one. No, no. Not only that. Not only people didn't deserve it. Because then, you know, I can theoretically die for someone that I didn't know. Gave them the benefit of the doubt. But die for someone who spit at me, cursed me, rebelled against me, and hates me. Try that one on for size. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I don't know how to emphasize this any better. I'm sure someone can. But uh, when you think about the atonement, it, it should help us to recognize that, that we don't need to be throwing stones at people who want to talk about the cross. The necessity of the atonement. See? Cook says the cause of atonement is based on the nature of God. How is that? God is righteous and cannot just simply say it's okay. See, the reason why I can say it's okay after all, everybody makes mistakes. You heard that from me because I'm comparing you to me. And as it goes, maybe I'm better than you or you're better than me, but we all make mistakes. And we can minimize these things. God looks at the situation and said, no, no. Not everybody makes mistakes. I don't. And so the standard is perfection. The nature of God. Not, not an arbitrary act of will. It comes directly from the divine perfection of, of God himself. So the, the, the atonement was necessary. What is, was not optional. I've had people say, well, God could have saved some other way had he so chosen. 
have a hard time believing that just on a pure pragmatic stand. If I had any other way than giving my son, would I do it? Wouldn't I, if, if I had another option, wouldn't I take the option? Rather than giving my son? I think he would. No, he can't. No, he can't. God can't do everything. You know that. He cannot do those things that are contrary to being God. That's why God can't sin. Not that he just chooses, it's not that he just chooses not to, it's that he can't. It would be inconsistent with what he is to sin. For example, God can't choose to not exist. He's around and says, you know, I think I'll not exist anymore. He can't do that. It's called a saity. He's self-existent. He is life itself. He, can't not, he cannot not live. He cannot not be holy. He cannot not be all-knowing. He cannot not be all-powerful. He cannot not be anything that's divine perfection. He is a necessary being, and all the attributes relate to necessity. God can't do certain things. He can't do absurdities. For example, he can't make a rock that he can't lift. That's an absurd statement. God can't make two mountains without a veil. Because if you don't have a veil, you don't have two mountains. You know, God can't make an apple, an orange, and an apple at the same time. You see, God doesn't deal with absurdities, and God does not deal with anything that's a contradiction of what he is. So when we say God can do all things, what I mean when I say that is that God can do all things that are consistent with being God. And He cannot do a single thing inconsistent. That's why when somebody said, can't God choose not to know? No, He can't. For that single flaw makes Him not God. That's why none of the prophecies can be wrong. That's why Jesus would go to the cross. Not, maybe not, but yes, he would. Because he was slain in the mind of God from the foundation of the world. Does this make sense? You know what I'm saying? The cross was a necessity, it was not one of several options. It was the only option based on who God is and based on what sin is. Would it have been sufficient if Christ had been strangled to death? Had to be a bloody, a bloody death. Would it have been sufficient if they said, we're just going to cut off your hand and let you go? That would have been bloody, but it wouldn't have been a death had to be a bloody death. Would it have been sufficient if they'd cut off his head? Had to die on a tree. According to prophecy. You know, you look at these things. They're, they're necessities. But didn't, um, didn't God set up the parameters for that? Yes. And he set the parameters up consistent with his nature. Would he have been physically capable of doing it? Yes. Would he have ever done it? No. Oh, yeah, but not without the whole process. The perfect world... Yes, consistent with who he is. Why is that? I can't speak for all of God and what's in God's mind, but I can say certain things. I'm stand back here a little bit. Just in case it gets a little hit close. See, the thing is, God could have made any number of possible worlds. But being all-wise, 
he would make only the best world. And to be perfect would require that he not make a mistake in his wisdom and make a lesser world than the best. But is that in the context of our um, knowledge about the relativity of best? No. I mean, what I'm saying is, is there, is, is there, is there some knowledge that we don't have nor have access to? Oh, well, there's lots of knowledge that we don't have. My point is, in the context of the world as we know it and see it and God has put it forth, that one aspect of a number of different ones that we can even have. But see, the issue that we're, that we're dealing with here in reference to God creating a world, theoretically, that did not have sin, and that being somehow a better world than the one that exists, would be a denial of the perfection of deity. When I say the best world, it relates to the fact that, sure, I don't have all knowledge about what... I mean, I don't even have a close approximation of all the possible worlds that could be. I mean, God does. But I know that since he is the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-wise, all-perfect, infinite deity, and attributing to him the highest qualities of perfection that I can possibly bring out of my mouth, that he would never do anything less than that which is consistent with perfection and all the attributes of infinity that he possesses. For if he created a world less than his capability of choosing a world that glorifies him the most, which is why we have the world, to glorify God, not to glorify us, to make a lesser world than the best would be a denial of himself. Sin is permitted by God. Remember, not caused by God. Sin is permitted by God in the best world that he created. He could have created a world, I'm convinced, that in which he did not permit sin. That is, he destroyed Lucifer. You know, here in this world, the real world, not the potential worlds, but the real world, he, he let Lucifer sin. In the real world, he let Adam and Eve sin. In the real world, he, he went through and he also had a lamb slain before the foundation of the world to happen in the real world. There's a potential world that could exist that he never made because in so making that world without sin it would never have been the best world to glorify him. God's ultimate purpose the chief end of God is ultimately not us. Although it may hurt our feelings. The chief end of God is to glorify himself. So he must have the perfect world to do that since he is the perfect God. So the perfect world includes sin. Now, I can speculate as to possibly, Walter, I can speculate as possibly why he might have sin in the perfect world. As I said before, I don't think the vessels of mercy in the world to come would fully appreciate the great holiness and righteousness of God and the great degradation of what sin is in God's view without the world we see. How can we appreciate the idea of how holy God is and how bad sin is unless we saw what it cost God in Christ? How would we appreciate the idea of how terrible rebellion against God is unless we saw the dredges of, in destruction a sin in its wake. It's in the contrast of the dark and light that we can appreciate the redemption and riches of God. Does that make sense, sense to you? That's what I understand. I may be wrong, but that's what I understand. And so, I, and I do know this, that even if I am wrong in my understanding of why it is, although I think I get an inkling of understanding in some things we see in Scripture, I do know this, that the world we have is the world we have, 
And it's a world that God created, which permitted sin. And I'm not going to lay anything at God's foot as far as a mistake. Now, having said that, I think there's a necessity of the cross and the atonement. The holy nature of God demands it. God cannot pardon sin merely on the ground of the sinner's repentance, for that would be impossible for a righteous God to do. Catch that? Apart from the death of Christ on the cross, a sinner could, let's say, come to God and say, You know, God, I really blew it. Forgive me. And God could not simply say, Okay. Because a righteous God demands that a penalty be paid. That punishment be meted out. Now, I realize that we have courts that sometimes look over things like that. We have parents that look over things like that. But not God. Because He's the perfect one. He doesn't let things fly by because he is, His holiness and righteousness has been offended by sin. And He just doesn't let the sinner go. On, <laughs> Hey, sorry about that, guy. No, no. Paul declares something very significant here in Romans chapter 4. He says, He is the just which means he has the standard and the justifier, one who declares a standard met. You see that? Paul puts them together. God is the holy, righteous, just God who demands that there be payment, that there be a a, a satisfaction for wrong. And he is also the same God who provides the satisfaction. That's pretty good. That's like being a judge and saying, I'm sorry, you know, somebody has to pay this, and then he takes out of his own pocket and pays it. Now, two, the nature of sin demands it. Sin is lawlessness, the exact opposite of God, and has to be dealt with in justice. Remember I said before, Never ask God for justice. God, all I want you to be is just with me. Oh, no, 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 no. No, no, no. I want you to be merciful. I want you to be gracious. Man, I don't want you to be just. Because I know what I deserve. (laughs) I don't want justice. Three. The fallen nature of mankind demands it. Mankind falls short of the glory of God. And the scriptures so state it. Well, there are different concepts of the doctrine of the atonement. But first of all, we'll look at a correct view, and then we'll look at the incorrect. And I'm going to have to cover this a little faster than I want. But uh, you have various concepts of atonement. One is under the concept of anti. You're going to have to read this. I can't read it all to you. But if you notice, the Greek terms are important. Anti, instead of, in place of, who pair, on behalf of, but sometimes like anti. The point of it is, he did not merely die for me, he died in my place. Substitution. Moreover, the atonement is vicarious. What does that mean? He didn't deserve it, right? He didn't deserve it. God's love wanted to save the sinner. The immutable demands of justice would not let him do so without someone taking it on himself. He did not deserve it. Judicial aspects of substitution, forgiveness provided, righteousness imputed, and efficacy for the substitution, which is the point of, will anybody receive the actual payment? Will anybody actually receive the, the forgiveness and the results of the cross than the person who in fact is saved. No. Whatever view you say. Redemption from sin occurs. The idea of a kinsman, redeemer, and Ruth is a good statement, but also the word used here is used in reference to slavery in the Roman world. You would have a slave on the slave block being bought and sold And you had people who went up and actually paid the price for the slave. 
Not to take them home and make them work, but to set them free. See, that's, that's the Bible view. Lots of words are used. Argorizo, ex argorizo, and so forth, or trao, and you can read the statements. The idea of redemption is, is fun, fundamental in Scripture. Reconciliation. By the way, in reconciliation, just to make one point here, God does not need to be reconciled to us. He hadn't moved a bit. <laughs> God didn't move in the garden. Adam and Eve were the ones who went and hid. See, God was the one who was pursuing. And I'm always amused by people who think that human beings, apart from divine grace, they're like, they think Adam and Eve would run around the garden trying to find God. Humankind has never looked for God. Oh, yeah, they look for a God. They look for their own gods, but they've never looked for the true God, the God of the Bible. They create their own gods. Or they make themselves God. But they're not pursuing God. God, however, reconciles the world to himself. Uh, propitiation. These are important concepts. We've talked about that already, and I suggest you read it. One thing important is number D, the objective nature of it. <clears throat> Well, let me just briefly look over the inadequate theories of the atonement, 390. <coughs> these are bad views. <laughs> that is, these are ones that do not comport with Scripture. However, having said that, listen. It is true that some of what is found in these views is correct. That is, they're not all wrong. There's a sense in which portion of them are right. But they're all, because they are faulty or wrong, views of the atonement. Recapitulation says, Christ in his life and death repeated all the stages of human life that belong to our state. Thus he replaced Adam's disobedience with his obedience. Well, I have no problem saying, hey, that that he was obedient, Adam was disobedient. He, in a sense, did what Adam should have done. I agree with that. But that's hardly what the atonement's all about. We're not saved because Jesus lived a good life. Ransom to Satan, which, interestingly enough, was held by a lot of church fathers. I guess they hadn't thought of another view. But this isn't, this isn't a good one. <clears throat> is that Christ's death was a ransom paid to Satan. By the way, I've heard this reiterated in the uh, group that's out of California sometimes, has a big radio and television stations. There's a view called, something very something that's like this, called the uh, Jesus died spiritually view of atonement. And it has the fact that Jesus did not even really pay for our sins on the cross. But he paid for him being in hell, punished by Satan, until God had released him. God found a secret way to get Jesus out. Satan didn't know about it. God sneaked in, took him out, and, and foiled Satan's plan. Where do you find that in the Bible? Faulty view of the atonement. Ransom to Satan? Well, there was a ransom paid for sure. But we'll find out it wasn't to Satan. <laughs> the dramatic theory, atonement, dramatized struggle and conflict and victory. That is, on the cross we see the struggle of sin and life and death and all these opposites. We see the struggle on the cross. And I think that's true. But something far more than a struggle of good and evil was on the cross. Although it included that. Then you have theories which affect death as affecting Christ's death as affecting man. Mystical theories, psychical, existential, you can read all of these. The point of it is all these views fall short of the view of the atonement. Let's move to soteriology under common grace. I want to say a few things about common grace. Uh, 
Under introduction at the bottom, the various uses of the term common grace, reform view, all but the elect. It's sometimes used to refer to any grace experienced by the non-elect. Or sometimes it's everybody. Maybe used to refer to grace con- commonly shared. All gifts to men. In other words, the point of it is God gives good gifts to everybody. Jesus said God brings the rain on the just and the unjust. Common grace. That is, God is gracious in some now some uh, non-salvific sense, some non-salvation sense to everybody. So that's common grace. That is grace that is common to everyone in the fact that God does good. Sometimes, though, Arminians use the term common grace as an interchange with sufficient grace to be saved. So I would argue common grace does not deal with salvation as we call it. Common grace deals simply with God restraining sin in the world. Government is an example of common grace as it properly functions under Romans 13. Nature providing benefit to us is an example of common grace. God doing good to us in many spheres is common grace. But it is not, in my view, sufficient grace. That's not how the term is used to refer to the capacity to believe and be saved. Now, Cook says on 395 the need for common grace, and he gives various reasons why we need it. And the evidences of it we can find... Uh, But probably our more concern is down at 395 at the bottom. The means of common grace by divine providence. The light of revelation. Revelation is out there and everyone can see it. Common grace. Human government is ordained to reward good and restrain evil. Common grace, see. Uh, a believer's witness to preserve society. That is, when you get involved in the societal process and try to restrain evil, pick an abortion clinic, marry a heterosexual. You know, you're expressing common grace. The presence of the true, good, and beautiful in nature, common grace, and so forth. Common grace and restrained sin, <clears throat> which needs to be restrained. I'm going to let you read that. But the general call of the gospel, if you want to argue that's common grace, that's probably not the way usually it's used. But it is a gracious act on God's part to even offer the gospel, the good news, and saying, if in fact you do believe, you can be saved. Now, when God says to a person, if you believe, let's say God came down as an angel in a physical body and said to a person that he knows from all eternity will never be saved. He knows this as a certainty, not as a potentiality, not as a, as a hypothetical. He knows a reality. He will never be saved. And he says to him, if you believe, you'll be saved. Is he telling the truth? He certainly is. If the guy does believe, he in fact will be saved. God knows, however, he won't. It doesn't change the fact that if he were to, he would be. Okay? Now, but see, the, that from a human standpoint, we do not know all reality. That's why I can come up to anybody and say... If you believe, you'll be saved. And I have no idea what their eternal destiny is. And I can in good faith say that. God didn't send me around to pick out elect people. I like, you ever heard of Charles Spurgeon? Great preacher. I don't know if you ever read his sermon. Great preacher. Spurgeon was a five point Calvinist. Some of these extreme Calvinists who don't like people and thinks God hates people and he doesn't believe in evangelism. Well, this five-point Calvinist Spurgeon, in his life without television and going anywhere but preaching in his church, brought a hundred thousand people to Jesus. You do that.
somebody said, Dr. Spurgeon said, if you really believe that cursed doctrine of Calvinism and you believe that, that God only elects some people, why don't you just preach to the elect? He said, you point them out and I will. <laughs> what presumption? I don't know God's mind. I can state Bible doctrine, but I can't pick out the one the doctrine applies to. Even that person that resists God all their life until their deathbed. Hateful, murderous person. Well, you, you come up with the bad as much as you want. On his deathbed comes to Christ because he was elect. You don't leave the world if you're elect without accepting Christ. You'll never be saved by being elect, though. You also have to believe. The point of it is, every end that God determines, He determines the means to the end. You never bypass the means to get to the end. God who determines the end also determines the means to the end. And so that person will, in fact, believe if he was elect. And he can die on his deathbed and you say, that's not fair. I mean, there are people that that worked their whole life for God and even were martyred for God and tortured for God and this guy gets off so easy. He, I agree, he probably doesn't even deserve to go to heaven. <laughs> like any of us. See the point? It's irrelevant. That's the whole point. Grace is for undeserved because it's undeserved favor. Yeah, he didn't deserve it, neither do you. And the fact that you spent your life serving God should not be looked at in a begrudging fashion. I thought it's supposed to be great. We should say, man, I feel sorry for that guy that he only got saved at the end by undeserved favor. He missed all the wonderfulness of being a Christian all of his life. No, no, and people, that's just not right. That's not fair. They must not be enjoying the Christian life. They ought to feel sorry for the guy that he didn't have that opportunity. Well, anyway. The general call of the gospel is to everyone. It's universal. It's addressed to everyone. But the efficacious call of the Spirit is only to the elect. And the Spirit has no difficulty figuring out who these people are. Which is where we're moving now on page 400. What a wonderful... Segue there. The difference between the general call and the effectual call. Effectual, you can use several words. Effectual, efficacious, efficient, resultive. The point of it, it's a call that not only is given, but has the results from the call to occur. In other words, it, it has an effect. The call of the gospel can go to millions. Who do not accept it? The effectual call brings everyone in to whom it's given. All the Father gives me. Well, most of them come to me. All the Father wants to have granted to me Many of them decide to do it, while others don't. I don't read that anywhere. All the Father gives me comes to me, and I will raise them at the last day. All the Father grants to the Son comes to the Son. No one can come to the Son unless he be drawn by the Father. You can't just decide to do it, and if God gives you, you come. Unless I just can't read English or Greek. Reads the same way in Greek as it does in English. All the Greek word for draw is really more like drag. Effectual call. The effectual call is that calling of God to the sinner by the proclamation of the gospel, whereby the atoning work of God in Christ is savingly applied by the Holy Spirit. That's a pretty good definition. That's a good definition. That's a definition I'd know. You know that's the one you ought to sort of grab hold of. Good statement. It's efficacious. God's aim will surely be realized. There will be an affirmative response to the call. Now, Reformed theology tends to use the word irresistible. 
And some people say, oh, that's terrible. That's holy rape. You know, God gets people and rapes them. I'm offended by that terminology. I think God rapes anybody. I think he is the quintessential wooer in which he takes people that are in rebellion and because of how he approaches them by the Spirit, they become willing inevitably, invariably, and without fail. That's what I understand by irresistible. Don Juan, not Jack the Ripper. You with me? So I've heard people say, oh, if you're resistible, grace, I mean, if you're always going to be saved, God must be forcing you to be saved. No, no. He does a work in you so that you who would normally rebel against Him and reject the message, in fact, embrace it by faith. Now, you think I know how that happens? No, I can't even figure out what a spirit is. I'm a dummy up here. I've been teaching for 27 years this area of theology. And I still can't figure out what a spirit is. I really can't. I can't figure out how big it is, how small it is, what the material it's made of is. There's so much I don't understand about a spirit. I just know I've got one, and you do too, and God is spirit. I mean, I know some things, but a lot I don't understand. Maybe I'll understand it later. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe I'll understand it later, see, by and by. But the fact that I don't know the why and the how for everything does not excuse me from knowing the what that is revealed. You with me? God gives us many, many whats in Revelation. He gives us relatively few whys and hardly any hows. Because the hows are beyond our comprehension anyway. I mean, I don't know how God works a work in a rebellious, bound sinner so that he's released from that and believes in him. I don't understand how that occurs. I just understand that it does occur. Okay? So when you ask me to give you more, I'm saying, man, I'm dumbfounded. I have no idea. But I can read the words. I had a question somewhere. Yeah, this effectual call that, that, that we have uh, based upon God's foreknowledge, we are saved looking back at the cross. We are saved in time and space looking back at the cross. Mm -hmm. Does this hold true for those who were before the cross? They're looking to the cross, although their knowledge of the cross was infinitesimal. They were looking to a vague promise that God, in fact, would come to save. And their election was no less sure than... Their election was no different. No, not, not at all. No different. The knowledge that they possessed as the object of their faith is different. Notice Paul's statement in Romans chapter 4 about Abraham believing God and has counted him as righteousness. You go back and read the Abraham account. And it's not the kind of content of, of salvation that Paul had with a whole history behind him, plus the cross itself. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as right. Believe what? Believe that God would send him a son. That's not what I believe to be saved, that God is going to send me a son. It's that he embraced the God who promises and those who got more and more light throughout the Old Testament, now the content is changing. The faith is the same. It takes no more faith to believe any of these factors than others. I mean, faith is faith. A person who truly is a believer will believe whatever God promises. And finally, the person getting closer to Christ is believing more and more and more. And finally, to the time of Christ, when finally God sent the full... Un, un, unhidden content the, the bright content of the truth of the cross I can't go back and believe what Abraham believed to be saved I have to believe what now has been revealed to me I have to stay up with the revelation I doubt if Adam, Adam thought at all in the garden about the Christ on the cross I don't think Abraham thought about Christ on the cross uh, I think Isaiah began to sort of glimpse it pretty good as a prophet 
But even prophets oftentimes didn't understand the full import of what they prophesied. So, uh, that's how I look at it. Uh, Mark. Yeah. Looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Abraham looked ahead knowing that God had promises for him and those others who believed like him. But he didn't grasp all that that meant. You have to wait for God to reveal himself to know what is the truth. Genesis 3.15. Uh, those of you who have not seen the Passion of the Christ, how many are there? Let me see your hands. Have not seen the Passion of the Christ. Okay, close your ears. I think the symbolism that, that, that Mel Gibson came up with at the beginning of that movie, In the Garden, when that eerie satanic creature is there trying to uh, convince him that he can't do this, he can't go through this, it's just too much for a human being to do. And he's not talking about just being crucified on the cross. Lots of human beings did that. The whole thing. You can't do it. And finally, he's agonizing and he's agonizing. And then you see a resolute feature come on his face. It's settled. Nevertheless, not my will, thy will. And then all of a sudden, something spectacular takes place that I will not say. Out of deference to my brothers and sisters who have not seen the movie. But I tell you, that was a focal point of the movie. It was powerful. And you've got to see it and see what it is. Powerful. The, uh, the, the thing is that God has dealt with sin in a very spectacular way, a way that, 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 uh, that Satan even didn't figure out. Is this a follow-up question? <laughs> like in the presidential press conferences? Abel gave a sacrifice, Cain did not, right? Is that a precursor of a type of election? Uh, no, I think it would be election. It would be the result of election. See, election is only God's choice in eternity of whomsoever he will choose. The fact that one did what he should have done and one not do may have indicated that he, in fact, was elected, but that's not election. See, election is God's action, not my action. The fact of the Spirit bringing me to Christ is merely the evidence of the fact that in, I was elected. Okay. I just wanted to ask, uh, to piggyback on what Mark was asked, uh, <coughs> Marines team up, this all works. <laughs> this, uh, Okay, I, I don't want to get into that. Okay. I don't want to get into that, Todd. Uh, the issue of Cain crushing. And the reason why is because I'm looking at 822, and I'm looking, and I haven't even got through justification and, 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 and eternal security. But, but let me just simply say that, that, that God in eternity chose whomsoever he wills for his own purpose. In time and space, those people that in fact chosen by God are moved on by the Spirit of God because they are chosen by God and brought to God and preserved by God for all eternity. Having said that, since we are the fault for our own sin and not God, the fact that we are not saved, those who are not, is not because of God, it's because of us. Election and God's efficacious grace is a positive work, not a negative work. It does not work against anybody keeping them from being saved. It works on behalf of those people to bring those who do not deserve to be saved to be saved. 
The people that are not, are not in any way affected. They have what they deserve. Those that are brought to Christ are receiving what they don't deserve. You cannot demand God to treat everyone the same in that respect, or there is no such thing as grace. God simply does what He ought to because we deserve it. Rudy, I know you want to ask a question, but I'm going to have to pass you up. Okay. I, I'm sorry, Rudy. i got to go. I know I'm talking about Rudy. He wants another question in, but I just can't do it. Uh, now, let's look here to regeneration. You have the effectual call, then you have regeneration. Now, re, in this situation, does mean somewhat like again. And go and replenish the earth, that means to plenish it again. There is no word plenish for which re is a doing it again. <laughs> but there is a word generate for which re is, in fact, doing it again. So sometimes, like, you know, you, you don't have torts and retorts. You don't have plenish and replenishes, you know. Uh, you have certain words, like you can have with re meaning. And here is one that does. But it means the new birth. It means to generate, make alive again. Sometimes it's translated to ganao, to be born from above, which is really better than born again. Anothen is better translated in that text as born from above. Uh, that's what Nicodemus could not understand, the fact of, of a birth from heaven, which is what Jesus is teaching, rather than a birth from the earth. You have other words used, and, and Cook gives that to you. But here, look at Strong's definition. Regeneration is that act of God by which the governing disposition of the soul is made holy, and by which, through the truth as a means, the first holy exercise of this disposition is secured. God gives new life. You're dead in your trespasses and sins. By the way, which does not mean that your spirit is non-existent. Death does not mean non-existence. Death refers to being separated. You're separated from God. You're not separated from sin. You're not separated from other people. You're not separated on the horizontal plane. You're separated on the vertical plane to God. That's the problem. So, yeah, you see people that are not saved doing all sorts of things, making decisions left and right. But you'll never find them making a decision for God. Paul in Romans 3 says that. Matter of fact, he reiterates it again and again and again. No man does good, not even one. Every man goes after his own way. There's none who does good, not even one. You know, on and on and on. I mean, the point of it is, we are that way. Regeneration takes that person who's dead in the sphere of sins and removes him from that and brings life to him or her. The necessity of regeneration, well, unless you be born from above, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Lydia, up there. And by the way, they have a little town right up above a place called Thessaloniki. Or in the Bible called Thessalon Thessalonica. Modern Thessaloniki. Uh, near uh, Neapolis in northern Greece. A little city called, a little video place called Lydia. Named after Lydia. A uh, woman baptized by Paul in a little river there that bears her name. God opened her heart to believe. The heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? The heart is separated from God in rebellion. Uh, is not the heart closed until God opens it? Regeneration, being brought to life, is necessary. The heart must be changed. Now, the effect of regeneration, the finished work of Christ. We're born again, are born from above, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Regeneration, being made alive, is what comes from the resurrection, interestingly. Forgiveness of sins not having to endure the wrath of God, 
made positionally in Christ is not what relates to resurrection. For resurrection brings new life. Since Christ lives, that's the point. Since Christ lives, we live. If Christ did not live, we're dead, still in our sins. And so, we use the word salvation, but sometimes we forget that salvation is made up of all sorts of components. Being in Christ, positionally. Being declared just before God. Being born from above. Being reconciled to God. You know, and on and on and on. I think there's about 40 different things that occurs at the moment we call salvation. When this thing begins. Lots of things occur. One is being born from above. Now, it's efficient cause. Key concept here. Efficient cause. Key concept. It is not human will. I know that hurts people's feelings who think that they somehow have a lot to do with salvation. After all, God makes it possible to be saved and then He leaves it with me and then I can make the decision whether I want to be or not. That's how the, sometimes it's preached. Okay? God makes it possible, then it's all up to me. I don't see that in the Bible. I do see the statement to believe in Christ and be saved. I sure do. But we've already dealt with that. It's not human will. That's a Pelagian view. Auto-salvation. Self-salvation. Whether it's Pelagian or semi-Pelagian, both see regeneration as a work of man cooperating with God. Well, you can read Wiley, who is, by the way, probably the best contemporary Nazarene theologian in this area, better than Perkheiser. But there's actually a very, very fine Arminian scholar of the 19th century. You may want to buy his volumes. I have them. John Miley is probably the best Arminian scholar maybe of the last two centuries. Miley, but he's different than Wiley. Okay? Now, it's, it's not only not, not human will, it's not the truth as a system of motives. Changing from unholiness to holiness. What is it? It's the Holy Spirit who does this. Don't you find that passage interestingly in John chapter 1? Where John, when he speaks of us, listen to the term. Listen to the term. But as many as received him... Now, that's a past tense. To them he gave, at that point, apparently, the right to become children of God. So, if you receive Christ at that moment, you have a right to become a children of, child of God. You're adopted. You have a right, an adoption right. To those who are believing in his name, presently, who were born, past tense, not out of blood. What would that be? That shouldn't be too hard. Human blood, the concept of passing on of, 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 the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the person. Nor of the will of the flesh. What do you think that is? We know what that is. Nor of the will of man. Somebody made a decision. I think I'll be saved today and be regenerated by God's Spirit. But of God. We're born out of God. As many as received to Him were born out of God. Now, what you've got to figure out here, when is the born out of God? Is it you receive God and then you're born out of God? Are you born out of God and then you receive Him? Interesting question. As many as received Him who were born out of God. Well, that's the issue here in the text. The question here is the Holy Spirit born out of, 
out of the water and the spirit in John 3, 5? That's a question all of itself. Well, I wish I had time to develop that, but I'm not going to. May I encourage you to read, if you get an opportunity, the uh, section in my study Bible and in my commentary on John chapter 3.